Now please welcome to the stage Jonathan Partlow, Chief Executive Officer, Aggressively Organic, and Shyam Ramakrishnan, Fellow, Research and Clinical Investigation, How about Amway. That? So this is interesting. It's uh, more like somebody just handed us a microphone and said, internet, your thoughts. Um, no moderation. To start out, one of the things I wanted to talk about is uh, something that Forbes mentioned earlier, and that's the distinctions of the words we use. And I think that's extremely important for us. With our name, Aggressively Organic, we get a lot of different reactions. Um, but we use the scientific term of the word organic that's been around for 200 years, not the marketing version of that word that is, because uh, this isn't a marketing conference, right? It simply means bonded with carbon, period. And that's important because all farmers, if you're growing plants, they're organic by the very nature that they work. And that's where the aggressively part comes in. We support all farmers. So just want to get that out there. So if you're getting ready to walk out of the room because of the name, we understand that too. Um, this is uh, Dr. Shyam Ramakrishnan. And do you want to tell them about what you do? Yep. Uh, so I represent Amway Corporation. Uh, I lead the botanical platform in the company. And I was very intrigued when my uh, boss asked me, hey, Shyam, can you give a talk here with Jonathan? I said, who is Jonathan? So I called him up and I said, wow, this guy is very interesting and this company is even more interesting. So I thought I'll come and talk to him. And la yesterday, half a day I spent with him. I learned a lot about him, about his company. So before I ask him some questions, I just want to uh, uh, give you some, some facts about our company, Amway. So we are the number one direct selling consumer products company in the world. We have uh, 8.6 billion in sales, 100 plus countries, 450 plus products, and Neutralite, which is our dietary supplement division, is the number one selling supplement in the world. 17,000 employees, 8,000 patents, 100 plus labs, number 35 on Forbes list in the category of the largest private companies. 1,000 1, scientists, engineers, and 50% of all our electricity in our headquarters is generated by wind. Now, you may be thinking, why am I here in the Ag Conference? We have 6,000 acres of farm spread around the world. So we produce many of the plant materials in Brazil, in uh, Mexico, in Trout Lake, Washington, and some in China. So that is the reason why I'm here trying to figure out what Aggressively Organic is doing and how does that model scale up to a company like ours. Yeah, it's uh, interesting, and a lot of people asked us, what's that Amway Aggressively Organic connection? Because I think so many people think of Amway as it was what our grandparents sold. What was that number again in billions? 8.6. 8.6 8, 8, 8, 8. billion dollars in sales. It's pretty impressive. And with that, we have a supply chain issue. All of us have a supply chain issue. Um, for us, people see our boxes, right? We go plants in boxes. Um, and it's easy to visualize me carrying it up here and putting it on a table. And if I tell you that it was grown in Fishers, Indiana, and that I can harvest off of this for a year, everyone can see that um, on your kitchen countertop. Um, I was actually kind of fascinated as I was walking up here and how many people stopped me and said, hey, I'm a beta user, I'm a beta 2 user, I've already ordered my stuff. It was kind of shocking to me here, it was pr pretty cool. But uh, Sean was asking some great questions yesterday. If you just want to talk about that Amway, you know, aggressively organic. Yeah, so obviously our company is dependent upon a very solid, stable supply chain. Mm -hmm. We can grow only so much. Right, so for us, our challenge is how do we establish a very sustainable, traceable supply chain for our herbal materials, our medicinal herbs. 
And we talk about this, especially we keep talking about, and we should be talking about it. How do we feed just today's population, but the 83 million people every year that are being added to this planet? How do we feed them? But we also have to grow the herbs. We also have to grow their medicines. Those are things that we don't immediately think about in ag. Now, there are some companies that are very forward thinking that get bio ag tech, bio ag tech sciences uh, that merge those worlds. And with our system, what's fascinating is without the infrastructure, um, you saw we have some out here and you saw in the pictures, it's a rack. It's a rack that you can pick up at a big box store. There's no pumps and there's no filters. For a supply chain answer, it's interesting because right now we're currently hindered by weather and seasons and the plant itself and also that efficiency. I mean, it's all about efficiency and ROI and how do you augment and supplement and maximize that return. What if you could grow staggered harvest just in time? Agriculture as a service. If you need X in May, you plant here then, and you can continue to grow and continue to harvest it locally where you're at and you lose that supply chain issue, or some of it. Uh, we struggle, by the way, with that supply chain issue, not because of the plants, but our lights currently now are still sitting in the ocean somewhere because of Hurricane Florence but there's also tons of ships out there that have food on them and have ingredients for botanicals and everything else that's involved. If we can take control of that locally everywhere, um, it's pretty empowering and we can scale way up. We uh, know that in our space in Fishers, we have 46,000 square feet total that we can use, but we just did the numbers and in 9,250 square feet of rack space, we can produce 354,000 plants a month um, using less water, 16 ounces instead of the three and a half gallons that's traditionally in the ground, and we can control that environment and stagger that and continue to harvest, as an example, harvest off of a head of lettuce for three months, so we also don't have that lag time in production of planting, germinating, to get there to, it, to where it's even harvestable. Interesting. And that's scalable. That is scalable. Now, in terms of, you know, this looks such a simple-looking system. Right. I'm a I simple mean, are they, <laughs> So are, are there patents on this? Yeah, so we currently have patents pending in 153 countries um, on the methods, processes, um, the utility, as well as protected by copyrights and trademarks, and uh, not just the the box, this, the method and process there, but also the system that goes along with it. From lights to the IOT, my background's not agriculture, my background is data science. Um, I am probably one of the very few people here that went to IU and not Purdue, but I still love Purdue, thank you Purdue. Um, because everybody wins, a rising tide raises all ships. And it's very cool to, to see that Purdue what they're doing. I mean, they're truly leading the way in a lot of areas. But yeah, so we have that, but we also have uh, the internet of things, even in these cardboard boxes. So afterwards, when we're you know after, back here, if you guys want to see it, we have a nice little app that this box alone has uh, interactivity that we can trigger STEM curricula, uh, we can trigger orders, we can trigger reorders, we can have you know a, a restaurant say, I can plan out a menu for an entire year and I want this at this time of year. Or you could say, I need this at this time of year, and you're not subject to those, those temperature. Absolutely. Because my understanding is, is how do you guys do it now? I mean, that's what we talked about yesterday. It's not exactly efficient. It's not exactly the efficient way, but there are opportunities for us to right. improve, and this is one of the problem models. Now, having said that, what is the weakness in these model systems? So there are some weaknesses. We grow what's appropriate. People often say, what can you grow? What can you not grow? We have 81 selections right now just for beta two. We've yet to find anything we can't grow, but the question is what's efficient? What's appropriate? Can you imagine rows and rows and rows and fields and fields of individual pods with corn in them? You could do it. It might be great for research to isolate and have a controlled environment, but that's not really an efficient use of our system. Uh, we can grow trees in uh, obviously larger models, larger um, embodiments, and, and that's an interesting thing when it comes to, again, supply chain. Uh, for example, we've had some conversations with a group out of India because some things require a freeze cycle, apples, 
peaches, cherries. And in Delhi, it was 88 degrees in the middle of the winter. So what we can do though, is we can individually take a tree and grow an apple tree or 12 of them, give them a 27 day free cycle. And now you have staggered harvest of apples because we've controlled the environment. And let's say they want that flavor of that apple from Indiana. We can get granular enough. I mean, we talk about precision agriculture to the plant level precision agriculture. We can make that apple taste like an Indiana apple or a Michigan apple, even from a specific year using the data of what the weather conditions and environment were of that particular year. And that has some long-term effects. That you know, $20,000 uh, bottle of wine because it had that wonderful grape flavor from 1968 is nothing more than a combination of the, genetical, the genetic um, parts of the plant and the environment. And when you combine those, if we can control the environment, we can environmentally modify organisms rather than genetically modify organisms. And the real power comes with the people that are genetically modifying organisms in those great strides combined with the environmentally modified portion of that. We, I, I, we can't even imagine that future and what that looks like. True, I mean, and, and there's definitely a need because in our supply chain, when we start looking at the herbs, we look at herbs, for some herbs we need the aroma, for the same herbs we don't need an aroma. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about an environmental modification mm -hmm. which can prevent the aroma from being expressed in those plants? I think it would be overreaching to say right now that I can take a rosemary, rosemary. and remove the the scent of a rosemary right now. In theory, it's possible. I haven't tested it. And I don't like to make those claims until we've tested it. But what we do know is that we can already um, increase the antioxidants in lettuce using our system just by controlling that environment. We do know that we can have nine, because the, our systems fit nine per square foot, we can take nine plants from the same seed bag and have each one of them have a different flavor profile simply by modifying either the lights, the light times, the light um, intensities, or the nutrients and water combinations or the nutrients. So we could have each one of those have a very specific and unique flavor profile. And then we start getting into things like, and what we're working on is working towards biofortification working with the way that the plant works with the environment and what it does and, and really testing that. And, and it, it opens up this huge space of possibility. Great. Now, and, uh, as you know, we eat a nutritionally deficient and calorically empty diet. Right. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm sorry, calorically rich and nutritionally deficient diet. Right. So are you going to change this paradigm? with this technology? I don't know that we can do it. I think that because we provide a means of production, we can do the research, but if it gets in the hands of an Amway or, or some of these brilliant minds at Purdue, we're a space of possibility. Get this out to other people because really that's what's happening. The reason we have 81 seeds and options, this beta two group, we started with 11 in beta one. It's because farmers from all over, from kitchen countertops to large scale farmers, tested everything on their own. They went rogue and we love when people go rogue. And that's what we're hoping is that people will take our system and say, you know what? We have a complete controlled environment. We've used it for R&D for R as a method of production. And with this combination, we can have something that mirrors the, the magic of like a, the, what, the golden rice where, where it's biofortified, um, increases the zinc. So we want, the goal would be to have a calorically, um, deficient, nutrient-rich plant that, that people can grow at home. And that combination, and basically have recipes that can be bespoke for each chef, for each person on their flavor profile. Great. Okay, one last question from my right. side is, uh, what are the next steps for you, for your company? Yeah. So we're a startup, we just launched our beta two in uh, June. Um, and so our first steps are wait for my lights to get in and get these out in the hands of, of uh, growers in their homes. But we have a lot of commercial interest, um, educational, really our, our whole, it's more than a motto, is grow food, teach kids, save the world, which is also why we use that organic definition. I can't tell a five-year-old organic means bonded with carbon 
and let's talk about organic chemistry and then say, oh, but just kidding, it really means this. So, so that's really where we're focused on is a big commercial. We, we have people like yourselves that are looking for supply chain solutions. Uh, we even have other countries now that have asked for small betas or to help them develop a program to remove their, uh, their food trade deficit uh, in a, throughout Asia in some areas. Great. Thank you. I think our time's up, guys, and uh, sorry. If you have questions, we'll be in the back. I just appreciate you guys being here, and I'm honored to be here for y'all. Yep. Thank you. F you, sir. Yep.